कुतुब दिख रहा है स्लाइड हाँ सर दिख रहा है ओके थैंक यू कुछ तो प्रोग्राम दिख रहा है क्या हाँ 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 देख रहा है देख रहा है विजिबल ना एकदम ओके ओके ठीक है डॉक्टर पात्रो यानी साइट टॉक शुड बी शुड बी अमंग आवर सेल्फ शुड बी अवॉर्डेड ऑन दिस फोरम ओके इफ देर इज एनी रिक्वायर्ड then uh, do it over phone keeping yourself my my uh sir uh welcome to speed mate yeah go to please hello hello nice to see you yeah. thank you for joining uh before time sir no problem very glad to participate so we'll be starting at uh, uh 3 o'clock sir so uh We need to wait for another five minutes. Sure. I was just um, connecting early to make sure that the connection worked. Everything. 
Please, sir. Hi, Pete. This is uh, this is Naik. Hi, Pete. This is Hello, this, this is Naik. Good Hello, morning. AK. Nice to see you, AK. Are you so well? Me, I hope so. Yeah. I am here. Let me also introduce uh, myself. I am Dipankar Maiti, director of this institution. Very nice to meet you, uh, Professor Maiti. Thank you. Sir. Are you all back in the offices now? I'm still working from home. Now we are back in office. We are back in office, 100%. Thank you. Here the situation is better as compared to UK. Yeah, we're still in lockdown, so we're all working at home. We're just about starting to come out now. Yeah. Meanwhile, sir, uh, let me give you an introduction of this institution. Uh, we, this institution was established in the year 1946 and uh, on the backdrop of a famine which was caused by a disease in rice, that is Helmuthsporium uh, brown spot. So government of India decided to have a focused research institute on rice and that's how it came up. And uh, now we had our 75 years of journey. So, so that's it. It's a very, very famous institute. I visited um, yeah. a few years ago. I came to visit the institute. Yeah, so. Yeah, I heard from good. Dr. Nye. Yeah. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, Patak, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kutub. How are you? Yes, sir. Fine. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Professor Smith is also with us. Good now. morning, Pete. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Good morning, madam. Good afternoon. Namaste, sir. Namaste, namaste, Dr. Patak. Namaste. Sir. <laughs> Is it time now? Yeah, it's three. So should I start now? Yes, please. Okay.
Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, uh, and good morning to Professor Pete Smith. Uh, so I welcome all of you to this uh, Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series of National Rice Research Institute. So in order to start this uh, lecture series, uh, uh, so I just want to make a few points here uh, before Professor Pete Smith, uh, because he may not be knowing all those uh, things. So in 1943, you know, India had a population of about 60.3 million people. And that year, nearly 2.5 million people died by the famous, infamous Bengal famine. The then government realized the importance of rice in the area and decided to intensify research on all aspects of rice crop. In the following year, the government decided to establish an institute for rice research, and this led to the establishment of the Central Rice Research Institute on April 23rd, 1946. And we are completing 75 years of our glorious presence this year. So National Rice Research Institute in a whole is a premier rice research institute in India with a vision to ensure sustainable food and nutritional security and equitable prosperity through rice research. The Institute has an incredibly significant historical background, which you take pride in being a descendant of the same. Today, on the occasion of first lecture of the lecture series organized by celebrating the Platinum Jubilee year of its foundation, I feel myself privileged to share a few facts of the glorious journey of the Institute with you since its emergence. Uh, but it's not limited to. In India, the seeds of green revolution are first shown at Sierra Rice and spread to the rest of the country with the efforts of extension and policy makers. The Institute was a significant partner in the Indica, uh, uh, Indica to Japonica hybridization program uh, from uh, Food and Agricultural Organization. Until now, the Institute has released 148 varieties. And the donor lines for many significant genes like submergence tolerance, salt tolerance, bacterial blight tolerance, and brown plant hopper tolerance are also identified at our institute and that made significant contributions globally. As part of the different way of celebration, NRRI has decided to organize Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series, which would be delivered by many eminent personalities from around the globe. We are indeed excited to start the NRRI Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series with the first lecture today by Professor Pete Smith a fellow of Royal Society London and a highly reputed and highly cited researcher in the globe. He will be talking on rice for food security while minimizing the environmental impact. Now I would like to uh, request our beloved director, uh, Dr. Deepankar Maiti to preside over the session. Uh, over you. to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Kudur. Uh, so now it's time to welcome uh, our speaker and to briefly introduce our speaker to the audience uh, by Dr. B.C. Patra, Head Crop Improvement Division. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's inaugural lecture series of our Platinum Jubilee celebration of the National Rice Research Institute. And this is the first lecture of the series. And I have the honor and the privilege to introduce our most uh, renowned uh, scientist of this uh, earth, Professor Pete Smith. As uh, Dr. Kutub told, he's, uh, he has several accolades to his credit, work, but at the, before I start his uh, reading out his uh, bio I mean biography, and uh, I would like to introduce him as the, that he's, uh, he has been able to, he has uh, accepted our ex uh, I mean, invitation and uh, agreed to deliver this uh, inaugural lecture for the celebration of national, uh, this Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. And the, though it is virtual mode, but then I, I think uh, most of the scientists will be joining from across this country. Only 41 have joined so far, but then uh, I think with time in another five, 10 minutes, uh, it will cross uh, century. But then, uh, sir, it is very, uh, we, we are very much thankful and grat grateful to you that you have joined uh, this program, even though it is afternoon for us, but then it is very early hours for you and it's mostly an inconvenient time for you to time as per the time zone is concerned. But then you have agreed to deliver this lecture at the early hours of the day. And then we, we are really thankful to you, sir. With immediate responses, whatever communications we have given to you, sir, immediately you have responded within a very short of time. 
and then sir we are really thankful to you and grateful to you to you on behalf of the institute on behalf of the icr also we are thankful to you and at the outset again i want to put it on record that our honorable dg of icr dr trilochan mahapatra we had also informed him about your uh, this lecture and he has expressed his inability and also regrets that uh, we, due to pre arranged uh, official engagements he is not able to join this meeting otherwise he would have very uh, i mean agreed to join this program because uh, he was very much interested to know the developments what is going on for this platinum jubilee celebration of this institute so maybe future programs he will join as the program the series goes on lecture series goes on he will be joining us to, for the celebration and then with this i will just uh, share my screen for the uh, important uh, accolades dr pete smith has acquired to his credit sir professor smith pete smith as you know sir uh, he is a, a professor in university of aberton scotland in the uk and then the, he has an expertise in several fields especially uh, modeling greenhouse gas carbon mitigation bioenergy biological car biological carbon sequestration global food systems modeling and greenhouse gas removal technologies he has received several fellows fellowships like fellow of royal society frs one of the very 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 kali baigona mojo bandha kobe Yeah, uh, he he is fellow of Royal Society of Paris, London. He is fellow of the Society of Biology. He is fellow of Royal Society of Edinburgh. Fellow of Indian National Science Academy. Also one of the accolades from our uh, India, our country, and also fellow of European Academy of Sciences. He has uh, uh, been able. He has been associated with several uh, international projects. He is also one of the co-leaders for the Environmental Modeling Group. He has been the expert uh, expert. Uh, team of the science of director of Scotland's climate change center. He is former director of food systems for Scottish Food Security Alliance crops. He is lead author of many special IPCC reports and many other important climate, greenhouse gases, soil, and ecosystem related reports. And uh, he has received several awards to his credit. He has received Royal Society Wilson Research Merit Award in 2008 to 2013. he received royal society research fellowship from 2008 to 2013 he also received philip deuser model a medal for the european geosciences union and uh, as i was telling he has uh, several accolades and uh, with uh, uh, he as uh, you can see the if you see his uh, expertise in editing this uh, greenhouse gases and all all uh, scientific models he is also one of the editors in global change biology and global change bio biology bioenergy several interest journals he is editing and then with this small brief dot bio data i will now uh, request professor peet smith to deliver his lecture on the topic rise for food security while minimizing the environmental impact thank you sir over to you sir thank you very much for that introduction namaste and um nice to see everybody um uh, i thank you very much for um inviting me to give this lecture and to share in your celebration of your 75th anniversary sir just okay can i interrupt sir Yes, please, uh, Professor Smith, sir. Can you record your uh, talk? If you allow us, we can record your talk, sir. Yes, of course, no problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I've taken the bold move to talk to you about rice for food security, while minimising the impact, the environmental impact. And I'm very aware that everybody on the call works on rice and will probably know much more about this subject than I do. So I hope you'll bear with me. So I'm just going to cover um, the role of rice in food security, and then I'm going to look at some of the environmental impacts, as well as drawing on some of the work that we do in our group um, to look at, to look at rice. So some of this work is done in collaboration, actually, with your institute and NMNRI, but um, uh, some work also with colleagues in China and in Europe working on rice. 
So I acknowledge um, the inputs of my co-authors who are shown on this title slide, who contributed some of the slides and some of the ideas that I'm going to present. So firstly, rice is a really, really important food globally. It's cultivated in 113 countries and it's a staple food for over half the world's population. It provides 27% of the dietary energy supply and 20% of dietary protein intake in the developing world. And rice cultivation is the principal activity and source of income for about 100 million households in Asia and Africa. So it really is a, 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 a crop of global significance and a food of global significance. If we look at where it's most widely consumed, uh, the, the, the country that consumes the most rice is China, but that's closely followed by India. Uh, and then also significant um, consumption, mainly in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, um, in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, Brazil, um, and Japan, but also a significant amount in Brazil and smaller amounts in North America and Europe. But as you can see there, uh, Asia and East Asia are particular hotspots for rice production and consumption, as you would expect. Rice contributes significantly um, to protein and energy and fat inputs uh, intake for a number of countries around the world. Um, we, as I've already mentioned, it's a staple food for half the world's population, and it, the nutrient that it supplies uh, is really important. So, in fact, in Bangladesh, um, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, over 50% of proteins and energy come from rice in the diets of those countries. So it's not just a luxury item, it's a staple food that is critically important for a large proportion of the world. And that's why the work that you do at NRRI is so important. If we look at the production um, of all different grains, uh, we see that rice is third only to uh, the production of maize or corn um, and wheat uh, that uh, have higher, uh, higher production levels, but rice uh, follows a close third. So it's important both in terms of consumption and, product and production. And if we look at where it's grown, it's grown predominantly uh, in Asia, so South Asia, you can see there, um, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia are the most important rice growing regions, regions. but also um, upland rice uh, in West Africa, um, scattered through South America, and pockets of production in Europe and in, in North America. But most of the rice is grown in Asia, and that accounts for 80%, nearly 90% of the harvested area in 2018. And uh, in Asia, um, uh, India, China, and Indonesia uh, are the three uh, major rice producing countries uh, with India at the top. But the total harvested area um, is increased um, by about 7 million hectares from 2008 to 2018. So it's a crop that is, grow is being grown even more widely um, uh, as, we, as we move through time. As well as, I've, I've already mentioned that it provides um, energy and protein, uh, but it also provides um, a, a range of other nutrients. So, and this is determined largely by uh, the rice variety. Um, and their agricultural influences on uh, the the um, the nutrients and and the uh, elements that are found in rice, um, for example, fertilizer, soil quality, and environmental conditions. For example, what, uh, how is how water is used. Um, so we can see that um, protein and uh, potassium uh, uh, are influenced by the fertilizer practice but also um, arsenic uh, content is also related to soil quality and irrigation water. And I'll come back to arsenic uh, contamination a, a, a bit in a moment. Um, but there are also post-harvest influences 
on the um, particularly the iron, the zinc and the protein content uh, to do with millage, um, and milling, uh, storage and cooking. In fact, the processing of, of brown rice uh, removes some iron and zinc um, to get white rice. Um, but then white rice can be fortified, for example, with iron, folic acid and vitamin A um, under the World Health Organization recommendations to, to, um, uh, to, to end up with enriched white rice, uh, white rice, which is just white rice that has been fortified um, with iron, folic acid and vitamin A to replace some of the uh, removal that takes place during processing. Um, it's, um, fortification is actually fairly widespread. If we look at fortification all around the world as a proportion of global rice population, we can see that some areas there is no fortification, but um, uh, in India and in China, for example, um, there is national requirement for large scale fortification, um, uh, as well as uh, many other countries, medium, medium to uh, small scale fortification, I should say, with um, wide, uh, more fortification in uh, South America, uh, North America, and some countries in Southeast Asia. But the other, the other, um, the other issue uh, that, that has to be uh, taken account of with rice, as well as providing all those nutrients, um, it can also become contaminated with arsenic. Uh, so here's an example from Bangladesh. Um, the arsenic is um, found in, as a natural source and gets mobilized into the groundwater. Um, the average arsenic content um, is 126 micrograms per kilogram of rice with uh, high values of up to 680 micrograms per kilogram. So that makes the daily intake of arsenic uh, between about 0.4 and 1.9 micrograms per kilogram. Um, the World Health, uh, World Health Organization estimates that about 43,000 deaths occur in Bangladesh um, as a result of uh, arsenic pollution. About 80% of arsenic contaminated land is used for agriculture and the cultivation with this um, with the contaminated water affects the um, arsenic contamination of rice so in addition to providing uh, vital nutrients and a large component of uh, people's diets in some parts of south asia and southeast asia um, contamination particularly with arsenic can be an issue and can, rice can be, an, can be a route through which uh, people are poisoned. Okay, so that's a quick look, a quick run through rice's contribution to food security, to nutrient security, and some of the issues associated with pollution. Um, let's just take a few moments now to consider the impact of rice on ecosystem services and the wider impacts on the environment. So this is a slide uh, taken from Amaresh Nayak's paper, um, which I contributed to. Thank you very much for including me in this study. Um, so I know AK is on the, is on the call, um, but this was a, an attempt to uh, consolidate all the information that we have on the ecosystem services that are provided by rice cultivation. As we know, ecosystem services can be uh, categorized as regulating services, provisioning services, and supporting services. So regulating services such as carbon, soil erosion, regulating nitrogen fixation and control of pests. The provisioning services are food and byproducts, and the supporting services are soil fertility, water flows, nutrient cycling, and soil formation. When we try to assess the, the value of the, these ecosystem services, we can get um, an estimate of the value of rice um, that is contributed, including all ecosystem services. So in total, the services that are provided by rice can be worth up to nearly $1,473 per hectare per year. So really significant. And most of that, of course, is due to the um, the value of food provided by the rice, which is estimated to value of about $1,000 per hectare per year. 
but the soil, ero soil erosion and carbon flow are negatively impacted. So we have to take into account um, uh, the, the negative ecosystem services that can be provided if the management isn't perfect. So these values are subtracted. But the other ecosystem services all, also contribute um, value, natural capital, to the rice production system. So in India, values uh, obviously vary by agro agroclimatic zones, and it's recommended by that payments are linked to the ecosystem services, and that could be used to reduce income gaps and to balance up. So at the moment, uh, farmers are rewarded just for the food that's provided, uh, the rice that's sold, um, but we could consider um, a subsidy system which paid, paid farmers for the other ecosystem services that they're providing. So that's known as payment for ecosystem services, and it's being considered in many, in many areas of the world as a mechanism to base payments to farmers. If we look at the sustainability of rice production systems, this is an example from Bangladesh. There are um, the uh, sustainability can be assessed in economic terms, in social terms and environmental terms. And this is just a diagram showing where the, um, the different components of sustainability, how they differ between different systems. So um, for example, um, we've got a, a large impact here for irrigated rice in terms of the economic returns, um, but irrigated rice um, is lower, for example, than others for crop diversity and uh, uh, about equal to the others in terms of the social capital and social sustainability. So we can compare all of these ecosystems, uh, all these different production systems, uh, rain-fed lowlands, rain-fed uplands, flood-prone, saline-prone, and this is the mean value. And we can work out the social and environmental and economic sustainability provided by these different systems. One of the main um, important environmental impacts of rice is water use, of course, particularly with paddy rice. Um, water water's, um, use by rice is, is shown on this slide. Um, uh, irrigated rice is shown in blue. Uh, the rain-fed lowland rice is shown in light blue. Upland rice uh, production is shown in the uh, orange to pink color, and then other rice production systems are shown in green. So uh, upland is predominantly in Central and South America, so most of the production in Brazil is upland rice, and irrigated uh, uh, rice fields are most common, um, particularly uh, in Asia, uh, South, East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, and elsewhere where it's grown. If we have a look at the, uh, the livelihood impacts, uh, 140 million households uh, in India um, are, um, are rely upon rain-fed rice, and it predominates in those areas where there's the greatest poverty. So there's a link between um, poverty, um, particularly in Africa and Asia, to do with the um, to do with the production systems. So these are related to um, uh, the level of um, the the um, the level of income and the uh, the, the livelihoods. <laughs> if we look at the water use by rice, uh, let me go back. Uh, the water use by rice. So this is um, green, grey, and blue water. Um, the uh, largest in, the largest rice use is in Pakistan, followed by India, Thailand, Brazil, going through to Korea um, and Vietnam at the bottom. So that the largest water impact of rice production is in rice uh, in, in rice is in Pakistan, uh, followed by India. And if we look at the national water footprint of rice production in billions of uh, cubic meters per year you can see that India is the country that uses the largest amount of water to produce its rice, closely followed by India, and then with the other countries, largely in, in Southeast Asia, South Asia and East Asia, 
following behind. So China and India <clears throat> account for over half of the water used by rice and um, amounting to many billions of square meters per year, uh, cubic meters per year. <clears throat> so uh, improving uh, water management in rice is one of the key impacts that uh, kind of the key research targets for the future. And it also impacts, of course, the greenhouse gas emissions from rice, which is what I'll talk about next. So this is just an example of how we measure uh, methane, uh, methane emissions uh, in particular from rice. And I know you have um, some great examples of this uh, NRRI. Uh, so for example, there are the chamber-based measures um, where there are manual chambers and you, you uh, measure the gases that accumulate uh, from rice um, using these uh, <coughs> manual chambers. <coughs> there are also automatic chambers <coughs> which can be used um, on flooded rice, aerobic rice, and uh, here's an example also on maize. So we can use these chambers to capture the gases and to measure the concentrations and thereby estimate how much uh, methane is being emitted from the rice production system. In addition to these chamber-based methods, we have eddy covariance techniques. And um, I think you have some flux towers at NRRI, which are measuring the fluxes of methane across fields. Um, so for example, there are some in, uh, is one in uh, Changsha Station in China, from China flux. Uh, Asia flux is a big uh, coordinated uh, effort to measure fluxes across Asia. Um, but you can use these any covariance techniques, which measure the uh, the methane uh, going into the eco, uh, going into the um, soil plant system and being emitted from the soil plant system uh, to get an estimate of the the net methane emissions. And of course, rice is a net methane emitter. In our group, we we model uh, we use uh, agroecosystem models uh, to to simulate and to predict what will happen under different management systems and into the future. So here's just an example of uh, this is actually a Chinese system. Uh, looking at what we've got here is shown in red uh, are the model simulations using the day set model, and what's shown in the uh, the the, the squares with the error bars are the measured values. So what we're showing here um, is the methane flux over the course of a few years from 2008 to 2014. And you can see that the day set model, which we're using to simulate uh, the methane fluxes, largely follows and captures fairly well the methane emissions that are being emitted over time. Uh, so we also have uh, other examples here, and you can see here an example where there were no measurements made, uh, but these are the predicted uh, fluxes shown here. So this is looking at, um, this is um, with stubble added, this is winter tillage with stubble added, and this is just winter tillage alone. And you can see that we can capture the difference in the methane fluxes from most of these systems using the day set model. If we plot out the um, observed versus the measured, uh, the simulated daily fluxes, we can see that there's a bit of scatter, but overall we have a pretty good relationship between the simulated and the measured values. So that gives us some confidence that we may get some of the daily values wrong, there's some scatter here, but it gives us confidence that overall on an aggregated level, we can largely predict the methane emissions uh, from rice systems. This is just another example showing instead the nitrous oxide fluxes, which are lower, of course, but the nitrous oxide fluxes, we get a bit more variation. So the model here is over predicting uh, nitrous oxide emissions compared to the measurements. So we tend to get the spikes more or less right. We tend to know when the methane, when the nitrous oxide is going to be emitted, but we sometimes get the, um, the size of the the flux of N2O quite wrong. So the day set model is much better for predicting methane fluxes than it is for producing nitrous uh, simulating nitrous oxide fluxes um, in rice systems. 
We can also use the models and measurements to calculate um, emission factors. As you know, uh, emission factors uh, are used by the IPCC and used in national greenhouse gas inventories to calculate um, uh, what the emissions are from different rice production systems. So here we're looking at the, um, the growing system uh, water regime, and here we're looking at the pre-season status. So for example, flooded, short drainage, long drainage, or tube drainage, this is continuous flooding, and these are the uh, uh, reduced, uh, reduced uh, uh, water regimes with mid-season drainage uh, and such like. But what we can see is that the, um, the, uh, the water regime uh, compared to uh, continuously flooded, when we change that to a short drainage, uh, we add no organic matter, um, we can uh, reduce the emissions um, uh, in many countries. So this is an example um, from looking across the countries at the emission factors, and the emission factors range from about 1.8 kilograms per hectare per day down to 0.6 kilograms per hectare per day. So really quite different across the different countries. If we look at emission factors at the regional scale, um, the emission factors for East Asia are around uh, just less than 1.3. They're much lower in South Asia, so India is, has a lower emission factor, and Europe has a much higher um, emission factor compared to East Asia and South Asia. We can add all these together. Um, so looking at um, what the uh, emissions from the world regions are, um, the total emissions uh, are dominated by emissions of methane from Asia, with a smaller amount coming from these uh, countries. Um, and in Europe, uh, this is just picking out Europe because we've done some work in Europe, uh, it's a smaller amount uh, uh, than uh, an even smaller amount there for um, uh, New Zealand and Australia. So the methane emissions globally are dominated uh, by Asia. So this is why the report, why the work on greenhouse gas emissions and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions at NRRI is so important. It has a global contribution to the greenhouse gas budget. And you can see that from here, um, the methane emissions. So East Asia, um, followed by uh, Southern Asia. So this includes India, of course. Southeast, Southeast Asia has the largest emissions, but that's closely followed by um, uh, Southern Asia. So a, a, a critically important region for global methane emissions from rice. If we look at synthetic fertilizer use by rice, you can see that the application rates um, uh, in India are very, very high, and in China are very, very high, and uh, large amounts uh, also in Southeast Asia, and where it occurs also in North America um, and South America. So over fertilization can be an issue um, in rice, particularly in, in India and in China. Uh, the amount of synthetic fertilizer that's used on rice accounts for about 17% of all of the nitrogen fertilizer that we use globally, um, which is about the same as the amount that we apply, glo apply globally to, to, to uh, maize and to wheat with other crops occupying about 50%. But rice is an important uh, recipient of nitrogen fertilizer, which partly drives those nitrous oxide emissions that I mentioned earlier. If we have a look at it uh, here, um, we're, when we're looking at the total annual emission of nitrous oxide, uh, it's about 50 gigagrams of N2O per year. And you can see the hotspots again are in India, other, other South Asian countries, and in uh, Eastern Asia, and Southeast Asia. The um, fertilizer induced um, nitrous oxide emission factor as a percentage um, is uh, increased with mid-season drainage. So I mentioned earlier on that mid-season drainage is a good uh, mitigation measure for reducing methane emissions. But on the other hand, it increases nitrous oxide emissions. So there is a trade-off between uh, saving emissions of methane 
and increasing emissions in fertilized systems of nitrous oxide. And with nitrous oxide being such a potent greenhouse gas, uh, it's got about a, a global warming potential of nearly 300 times carbon dioxide compared to methane's global warming potential of about 25 times carbon dioxide. You can see that this smaller increase in nitrous oxide emissions can be significant in the global carbon budget. But China and India and Bangladesh are the top emitters uh, with uh, 23, 8.3 and 2 gigagrams of nitrous oxide annually. So this is the figure for India, uh, uh, 8.3 gigagrams of nitrous oxide emission globally. So it's some work to do there on reducing uh, methane emissions and also nitrous oxide emissions from rice. So the work you're doing at NRRI is very important in this respect. So what can we do about it? I've mentioned that there are a number of issues associated with rice production in terms of water use and in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but there are things that we can do. There's management that we can change to reduce those emissions. Here's an example um, uh, from uh, the globe, looking at the global mitigation potential of rice. Uh, so this was uh, looking at uh, the maximum reduction potential. Uh, this is comparing across all studies, uh, and these are estimated to be uh, uh, a mitigation potential of about 500 megatons of CO2 up to over 1,000 megatons of CO2 um, that could be uh, reduced by better rice management. And these um, uh, values here are just shown projecting out into the future. So some of the larger potentials are for more, better technology in the future. If we look at um, uh, the mitigation potential for rice, we can also uh, calculate the cumulative uh, emission reduction that we get um, uh, in terms of how much we spend. So this is called a marginal abatement cost curve, and the marginal abatement cost curve can be, um, can be provided, and there's two examples here, one for Asia and one for the rest of the world, um, and this is to do with um, uh, uh, different pathways uh, towards how much it costs uh, compared to how much emission reduction you get. So you can see that for an emission reduction of about 30%, uh, that could maybe cost around about $200 per tonne of CO2, uh, and that increases over time. Uh, this is just an example of the mitigation measures um, that were used to construct the marginal abatement cost curve. So the, the things that we considered were alternate flooding and drainage, uh, direct wet seeding, uh, phosphogypsum, uh, replacing urea with ammonium sulfate, and uh, ammonium sulfate rather, and using rice straw as a compost. And each one of these with different costs and different emission reduction potentials. So this one gives, uh, these ones here give a high reduction at low cost, and these ones give a high reduction at a high cost. In a, an analysis of um, uh, greenhouse gas miti mitigation options for rice in China, um, this was Dali Nayak, uh, who works in our team, uh, did uh, this analysis. Uh, which looks at moving away from continuous flooding to intermittent flooding or alternate wet and drying cycles, and also looked at um, uh, rice fish, rice duck farming systems, uh, which not only reduce uh, emissions, but also improve livelihoods and present a sort of a, a great example of uh, a circular economy. So these sorts of systems are already being used in China uh, and could be maybe used more widely in rice growing regions. So this is looking at the um, this is looking at the overall impact. So conservation tillage, um, and all of these ones showing a decrease all the way from this one's downs, showing a decrease in the climate impact. Some of them showing an overall increase in the climate impact. So using green manure, livestock manure, and straw application, whilst it's good for increasing soil carbon 
it also increases the emissions of greenhouse gases. So these ones are shown to overall be um, net, um, net bad, net, uh, net negative for the climate, but all these options further down, for example, livestock manure in mid-season drainage systems uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the, from the system. So there's a number of interventions that can be applied to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases from rice production systems. This is um, just looking at um, a, a, a range of measures that can be applied um, to look at what, what happens in terms of net greenhouse gas balance, so what things help the climate, but what also helps the, the yield change. So if we look at uh, uh, no tillage versus conventional tillage, we can see a, a net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, but also a slight, uh, a slight uh, yield decline. If we look at straw return versus removal, we can see a net benefit in terms of yield, but a slight increase um, in greenhouse gas emissions and a high replacement of organic nitrogen with uh, a high replacement of mineral nitrogen with organic nitrogen uh, is shown here, which shows um, a decrease in emissions and also an increase in yield. So this is a win-win option. We've also had a look spatially at the impact of changes in management of rice fields in Bangladesh. Uh, this was a PhD student of ours from Bangladesh called Khadija Begum, uh, who looked at um, all of uh, uh, spatially, she applied the descent model spatially to examine what would happen with different changes in management. So there was alternate wet and drying, um, a residue removal of only 15%, reduced tillage, and she looked at replacing some uh, mineral fertilizer with cow dung. And what she found was that we could increase the soil organic carbon in a number of uh, regions. Uh, this was done on a district level. Um, uh, but when we looked at the greenhouse gas changes, um, this was um, sometimes the greenhouse gas balance, uh, the increase in greenhouse gases um, were counteracting slightly the increase in soil carbon. So this is showing that we have to not only consider soil carbon, we can't just chase carbon sequestration. We also have to look at the impact of management on the emissions of other greenhouse gases. Uh, overall, the effect on soil carbon sequestration shown here in blue um, for, uh, this is uh, with um, continuous drainage, alternative wet and drying, uh, integrated uh, manure management and reduced tillage. Uh, we can see that the net balance here is generally uh, positive, um, but with uh, some examples here, with, this is cow dung, sorry, uh, we can increase carbon sequestration, but we also increase greenhouse gas emissions, but it still results uh, in an overall uh, net positive impact. So most of these systems, in fact, give a net positive impact on climate change mitigation. Uh, reducing the emissions. Uh, if we look at the uh, impact uh, of neem coated urea in, in rice in India, uh, this is the example, uh, this, these are the examples of different types of neem uh, in different systems. Uh, and you can see here that there's an 11% uh, increase in yield um, overall uh, by neem coated urea. Uh, but the effect varies by soil type um, and also by application method. But overall, we get a net change in methane emissions of somewhere uh, just less than 10%. So uh, neem cake and neem oil can uh, give us uh, uh, improvements in terms of methane emissions. A 7% reduction shown here um, and changes in nitrous oxide emissions of about 25%. So this is an example of where we don't get a trade-off, where we got emissions of methane emissions and, a meth and, and reduction in nitrous oxide emissions. So this is a win-win option. 
So that's a quick whistle stop tour through um, throughout through the rice research that largely we've done in our group, but also drawing on some other sources. As I said, you know this area of research better than I do, so I'm sure that you're going to have many questions. But in conclusion, uh, rice is a globally important crop and food. Uh, it's important for nutritional uh, security. Uh, rice production services can provide a range of ecosystem services. It uses a lot of water and produces a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So a challenge for rice production research is to find ways that reduce water use and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions whilst maintaining productivity. And this is the key challenge, I think, uh, for the coming decades. So I'd like to say for, for all of you working at NRRI, um, keep up your good work. It's made a significant contribution to our understanding. Uh, you've done 50, uh, 75 years of excellent work already, and I'm looking forward to the next 75 years of quality rights research. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions or discussion that you may have. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter Smith, uh, for the wonderful uh, talk. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, uh, we also thankful that you acknowledge hugely our contribution to the field that you uh, work, especially our crop production scientist. Uh, so it was not originally in the agenda, but as uh, Professor Smith desires to have question, so sir, I. Uh, uh, um, uh, Director, sir, can I uh, take some questions from the audience? Yes, we can go ahead because he has allowed us to have yeah. some questions. Yeah. So if anybody have any question, you can raise your hand and we would allow you to directly uh, ask question to Professor Smith. So, Pete, uh, I, I am having a question for you. Uh, so recently, you might have heard that the three different farm laws that was enacted by government of India, and uh, the farmers they are protesting, and uh, some of the environmentalists they have jumped their gun and uh, again oppose the farm law. But the, from your presentation. So as rice, it consumes a lot of water, and in some pocket, uh, the lot of uh, your carbon footprints are there. So when these laws, they are uh, promoting the diversification and giving the market access to the uh, people, the uh, farmers, earlier those who are not accessing the minimum support price of the government. So uh, from uh, environmental point of view, so this is a good initiative or uh, you do have some alternative, if you, if you can, if, if you are following the Indian farm uh, uh, law that, is, that has been implemented and uh, it is having uh, impact, uh, uh, I think uh, reactions from all over the world, even uh, the, some, some of the environmental activists, they have opposed it. So yes. So I, I, I want to just hear from you, your perspective. Yeah, so, so from the point of view of, I don't know exactly the impact that this is going to have on rural livelihoods, but um, clearly the government has a role to play in supporting farmers, but also for encouraging sustainable production. So any law that was introduced, I've not seen the detail of the laws, I've just seen the protests on the television, on the news. So I only know that it's caused a lot of um, uh, anger and, and, and unrest among the farming community. But the laws, I think, if, they, if they're going to be changed, farmers receive subsidies or guaranteed prices from the government. So the government should be able to provide those, um, those payments in a way that support rural livelihoods, farmers' livelihoods, but also encourage and incentivize good practice to reduce the environmental impact of rice production. So I'm sure um, it's very, very difficult to do. This is a sort of a scientific thing, and it's difficult to do this through legislation. But I hope that the legislation is being introduced um, to improve the sustainability of rice 
but an important thing is to take farmers with you, to carry them with you, and to also support their livelihoods, because the farmers are the people that need to change, change their practices. So if you lose the farmers, you lose the confidence of the farmers, then the laws aren't going to be so effective. But I'm sure you know way more about this than I do, AK. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we have another question from Dr. Vishwajit Mandal, who is the principal scientist of NRMI. So you can go ahead and ask him a question. Uh, I congratulate and uh, thanks uh, Professor Pete Smith uh, for an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I am having mainly two issues. Uh, one issue is regarding uh, fortification of rice. Uh, in my opinion, uh, whether fortification uh, it is uh, really needed for uh, all minerals and micronutrients uh, uh, in case of rice. Uh, I am asking this question because uh, some of the minerals and uh, micronutrients that remains uh, naturally uh, in abundance in vegetables and other uh, food items. So uh, it is not needed for all. Uh, so there uh, might be uh, event of overconsumption or toxicity. So uh, what you would uh, say in this regard? And my second question uh, is regarding uh, payment of uh, eco ecosystem services. Uh, rice production system can provide a lot of ecosystem services. Uh, it is available. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it is uh, irrelevant to uh, recommend uh, for payment of uh, payment for ecosystem services in case of uh, paddy in isolation. Uh, because uh, uh, it may be applicable for other crops also. Uh, specifically, uh, in case of uh, crops, uh, which supports uh, pollination services or uh, which are having aesthetic benefits uh, and uh, uh, in case of crops where then, uh, the difference between uh, price of ecosystem services and their object price, that means uh, market price, uh, that is very high. Uh, so in that case, uh, it should be uh, uh, think of first. Thanks. Yeah, so the two questions on fortification, I think it's right to to make sure that that is tailored towards, firstly, the, the nutrient content of the rice, the stuff that's, the nutrients that are already available. You don't want to over fortify if those are already present. So that should be a, a decision taken sort of at least within country and probably at sub country sort of regional level, uh, at the state level, maybe in India. So the fortification would differ maybe between states and between countries. So I think that's important so that you just get the right amount. Fortification, I think the, the danger of over, um, over um, fortifying, um, produce, uh, giving people too much, for example, folic acid, um, the, danger, the risk of that is probably lower than the risk to people who don't get enough. So fortification, I think you'd agree, is, a, is generally speaking a good thing. Um, it's gonna save more people than it damages. But getting that balance right between the amount of nutrients that you, you, that you uh, fortify with is going to be really important. And the other question about the payment of ecosystem services, um, yeah, that's really important. So uh, what we have to do is we have to assess it for all crops, because as you say, other production systems have also provide ecosystem services. And then I think the most difficult thing is comparing it to a counterfactual. If you didn't grow rice, on that piece of land, what else would you use that piece of land for? And it may be that in some systems, um, not growing rice there would provide more ecosystem services, particularly if it's a very a natural forest area with high biodiversity. So that particular area may have less ecosystem services compared to the counterfactual of what you would otherwise use the land for. So I don't think we have a we don't have a framework yet which, which could be applied with confidence because we haven't decided on the rules for accounting for those ecosystem services and comparing it to the counterfactual. So I don't know the answer, but I do, I do recognize the problem. So thank you, Pete Smith. And also I, I would like to make a comment over it regarding the point raised by Dr. Mandel. That is whether really this fortification is required for rice or not. Yes, as you mentioned also, it is not uh, required for in general, but for a particular segment, the poor people who thrive mainly on rice and have less access 
on vegetables, fruits, and pulses. So we can target those type of rice for that target uh, people. Okay, thank I you. Quite, that's a good point. I quite agree. Okay, so uh, we have a few more questions from Dr. Pratap Bhattacharya. Uh, he is the principal scientist of crop production division of NRI. So Pratap, please. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, you are audible. You are audible. Uh, Good morning, Dr. Smith. Myself, Pratap. Pratap here. Am I audible? Good morning. Huh. Yeah. So I have two questions, not question, but I want some comment from you on the two aspects. One uh, is, number one, what is the present status of nitrous oxide exchange emission through AD covariance system? The advancement of this particular technology, uh, from you, I only heard few from uh, Red Spring from Japan only. What is the present status of world and Europe want to know? And, and the second one, it will be different and maybe some continuation of the previous questions. Well, now, when we're talking about the climate smart agriculture, what your opinion about the subsidy versus incentive to the climate smart agriculture? Means I want to mean subsidy to nitrogenous fertilizers, uh, eventually some, somewhere is uh, encouraging the into emission rather than if you go for incentive the climate smart agriculture by fixing the rate or other perspective so what what is your view in that particular aspect thank you repeat please okay so so i'll take the nitrous oxide question first and the fertilization um we know that um where or where fertilizers nitrogen fertilizers are subsidized we know that we get over fertilization so it's a particularly big problem in China, but also a problem in India. So we, we know that if you provide um, fertilizers that are very cheap or free for farmers, they will tend to over, over, over fertilize beyond the economic optimum and beyond the optimum that is required for the plants. Because if it costs, if it, it costs so little, uh, why not apply more? Um, so, so that is a big issue. So I think subsidies on nitrogen fertilizers should be phased out um, or should be at least reduced or only provided if, they can, if, if it can be checked that the right application rate is being used. So that's really important. What we found uh, when we were looking uh, at, at, these, at the issue in China Part of it is just to do with the size of the bags that fertilizers come in. Far farmers are using uh, f uh, farming quite small areas of land, but the fertilizer comes in a large bag. They, they're not gonna leave it for next year. So they just end up applying it all to the land rather than leaving half of it for next year. So just by halving the size of the bags that are provided, providing it in smaller size bags, changes farmer behavior. So there are simple things which aren't to do with anything scientific, just to do with the way that we present the farmer, we present the farmers with the fertilizers that can make big changes in farmer behavior. So I think it's partly reducing subsidies, but partly trying to change farmer behavior. Um, what was the other question again, please, Pratap, I forgot. Uh, Dr. Fast question was the advancement or present status of uh, measurement of nitrous oh, yes. oxide through AD. Yeah. I got that, yes. So so that's um, it's not really very, very well developed. I understand. I don't measure it myself. I understand that um, tunable diode lasers were the way to measure it um, about 10 years ago. But now people are using quantum cascade lasers, which are cheaper um, forms and, and ways of measuring end to or across fields. So... I'm, I'm not speaking from personal experience because I don't do those measurements, but I work with people who do do those measurements and they tell me that quantum, ca cascade, la quantum cascade laters are the, are the best way of currently measuring it. Whether we can integrate it in the future into eddy covariance systems, which can measure CO2, uh, methane and nitrous oxide simultaneously, that would be the dream thing, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if we uh, don't have any question, any more question, uh, so uh, let me ask you a silly question from my uh, my own behalf. So, uh, do you think uh, is it realistic to uh, develop or getting any germplasm that would reduce less methane? 
I mean, place methane uh, uh, emitting rice variety like that. So do you think, is it a uh, it's possible option in future? There's some, some mechanism so, so that. Yeah, I, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Um, but you can imagine mechanisms where the germplasm could be changed. For example, we know that quite a lot of methane emissions come from the arenchyma, you know, and the other channels within the rice. So maybe, maybe sort of um, looking at differences in the germplasm for the amount, not the, not the methane production, because the methane production is mainly uh, in, the, in the soil, in the paddy soil. Um, but the, the, um, the transfer of that methane uh, out of the system, out of the top of the water, that can be a, a big issue because when the methane bubbles through the aerobic parts of the, the system, it's then oxidized to carbon dioxide, and then you get less methane emissions. But the, um, the fact that rice transports the methane from the root zone straight out the top, it doesn't get a chance to be oxidized. So that's maybe one thing that could be examined. I'm sure you know more about it than I do, you know, with a lot of this, that it's, it's one area that we could imagine that there could be breakthroughs in the future. The size of the effect, I don't know, but you can imagine that there's, uh, it, it's, a, it's certainly an area worth investigating. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, what I see, I don't, we don't have any more questions. So uh, you we move forward to the next part of this uh, uh, lecture series event today. So now the time uh, by uh, our president of today's event, Dr. D. Maithi, director in our life, for his address on this lecture. Over to us, sir. So thank you very much, Dr. Kutub. And a very good morning to Professor Pitt Smith and good evening to one and all. Prospective Professor Pete Smith, University of Aberdeen, Scotland, UK, the August gathering on virtual platform. Senior officials from ICR headquarters, my colleagues of National Rice Research Institute and other institutions, ladies and gentlemen. It is really my great honor and proud privilege to listen to Professor Pete Smith the world-renowned environmental scientist working in University of Aberdeen, Scotland, UK, and to be with you all. As you know, Professor Smith's area of research are modeling greenhouse gas and carbon mitigation, bioenergy, biological carbon sequestration, global food system modeling, and greenhouse gas removal technology. The area of environmental pollution and climate change is the matter of current global concern, which is predominantly the consequences and developments in several spheres, including rice production system, masterminded by and implemented by the mankind. And most important is it is for the mankind. So the developments are obvious. And some ill consequences have also started marking their footprints on the environment, which is also obvious. This necessitated research on mitigating those footprints to keep our planet livable for all creatures on the earth in coherent manner for maintaining the desirable ecological balance. We are really amazed to listen to such a thought provoking deliberation on these burning issues in relation to rice production system from Professor Smith, which has mesmerized the whole audience as I understand, and created an environment of knowledge for which I think we all need to take some time to imbibe what we have learned for proper understanding. So I should stop here now to keep the vibe on. Thank you very much, Professor Smith, and thank you all. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, very brief uh, and very encouraging uh, address. So uh, now uh, we are at the end of this uh, today's session, and it's time for a formal vote of thanks, uh, which would be uh, given by myself. So 
Uh, so at the first, we are immensely thankful to Professor Bill Smith for accepting our invitation and delivering the first lecture of NRRI Platinum Jubilee Series. Despite being in the early morning in the UK, we know that you have to manage your schedule. Uh, the topic is the most discussed and most needed for sustainable food production. So uh, it, it, I think it, it is the wonderful option that we got uh, uh, from you to start our series. Uh, by your lecture. And then I uh, also would highly acknowledge the support from Dr. Deepankar Maithi, director, for his time in presiding over the session and for helping in every aspect of organizing this kind of lectures. Uh, we also thank Dr. Himang Shupathak, director, ICR National Institute of Abiotic Stress Management, for joining us today. And uh, we also acknowledge your immense contribution to NRLA as the former director of the Institute. Dr. B.C. Patra, Head Crop Improvement Division, Chairman of this Committee for Organizing the Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. Uh, I also want to highly thank uh, Dr. B.C. Patra for supporting us and coordinating the whole committee for successfully arranging this kind of lecture. I thank Dr. Sutapa Sharkar, Dr. Ranjan Mohanta, Mr. S.K. Sinha for helping us in organizing this series as members of the committee, especially Sutapa Sharkar uh, for writing the introductory briefing up to this lecture. I must acknowledge the support from Aris Sale, especially Mr. Shantar Shetty, the man who does not get tired. You know, during this COVID situation, as we moved every meeting online, he has a huge workload, but he is continuing his all the support to us. We thank all the NRI personnel and especially all the Platinum Jubilee Celebration Committee members and all of you for joining us today. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Paul. And we end here. And over to you, sir, uh, Dr. Antipopovic. So it's to you to call it an end. Thank you very much. So should I tell anything special to Dr. Peter Smith, sir? Uh, I think we should. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Let us join day after tomorrow again for another lecture. That I think Professor be... Smith has received the links for the next series of lectures. Yeah, day after tomorrow we'll be giving the reminder again for the link and other things. Thank you, all, one and all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.